In this second part, we'll take a look at absolute maxes and mins. We were looking at relative maxes and mins before, but the absolute is the highest or lowest out of all the local maxes and mins. So if the region is not closed, you calculate all the Z values from your critical points, determine which one is the highest, which one is the lowest. So now what happens if you have a closed bounded set? Remember in Calc 1 terms, if you had something like this, and you wanted to find the max and a min on a closed interval, you had to check the endpoints because in this case, the absolute max happens to occur at one of the endpoints, even though the min occurs at an interior point. So how does that look in three dimensions? Here's what we do. This region on the bottom is the domain for that funky looking region up on the top. So the boundary on here determines the boundary up on the top. So there is actually a boundary set of boundary curves on this top region here, right? You're looking at this thing that comes ooh, up here and down here and back up on the other side, etc. So really what you're doing is you're looking for maxes and mins along that boundary that will help you to determine what the max and min is on that specific region, right? The regions are not always defined in very, very simple terms. Sometimes you may be looking for the part of the three-dimensional graph that lies on top of some given surface on the bottom. Okay. There's two ways to do this. One way is to set up parameters. The other way is to stick with X's and Y's. So this is the first example, the first method. Find the absolute max and mins on some region using a single variable. So here's F of X, Y equals six minus X squared minus four Y squared. So it's open downward. My region is a rectangle. It goes from negative two to two on the X's and negative one to one on the y. So I'm looking for the surface above this rectangle on my base. So I want the z values only produced by that rectangle, like that picture I showed you. There, was, there would be more to the picture if I expanded that region on the bottom, but I didn't. So what's my step? The first step is find the partial derivatives, critical points for the interior. So I'm gonna be looking for the highest point on the inside and then the highest point on the outside. And at the same time, lowest point on the inside and outside. So let's give ourselves some space here because I have this funny feeling we're going to need it. The original function was f of x, y equals 6 minus x squared minus 4y squared. So the first thing is let's look at the interior point. That's the max or min. Partial with respect to x is going to be negative 2x Partial with respect to y is just that last term, so negative 8y. Set each of these equal to 0, and it turns out you got a critical point at 0, 0. So what is the y value? f of 0, 0 is equal to 6 minus 0 minus 0, which is 6. All right, hang on to that number for a little bit. Second thing, then, is let's test the boundary. So now when you test the boundary, what does my rectangle look like? The rectangle goes from 2, negative 2 on the x's, from negative 1 to 1 on the y. So this thing here is in the xy plane, and then the rest of that curve is above it. So start with y equals 1. Right? y equals 1 is up at the top here. So if I start with y equals 1, then I'm looking at points where I have some x value, but the y value is 1. Sub it in. That'll give me 6 minus x squared minus 4 times 1 squared. That gives me 2 minus x squared. So now look at 2 minus x squared on that interval. So look at 2 minus x squared on the x values from negative 2 to 2. Our critical point, so we're going to test three things. We're going to test the critical point, and we're going to test the endpoints. The critical point was at x equals 0. So 2 minus 0 squared gives me 2. Hang on to that number. The endpoints are x equals negative 2 and x equals positive 2. When x is equal to negative 2, I get 2 minus negative 2 squared. 2 minus 4 is negative 2. Hang on to that number 2. 
All right, again, 2 minus x squared when x is positive 2 will also give me 2 minus 4, which is negative 2. Those are the z values. So I have extrema at z equals plus minus 2. That's what I got from looking at y equals 1. What would happen if I put in y equals negative 1? y equals negative 1 is the bottom boundary. So if I looked at f of x comma negative 1, I would end up with 6 minus x squared, and then minus 4 times negative 1 squared. Well, that's 1. 1 times negative 4 is still negative 4. So it turns out I still get 2 minus x squared for putting in a negative 1, which means I get everything exactly the same from there. So y equals 1 and y equals negative 1 give me the same set, so I don't have to test it twice. All right, but I still have to test the 2s. Right, I still got to test x equals plus minus 2. Hey, let's look at x equals 2. That means the x is 2, but the y can change. So I end up with 6 minus, instead of x squared, I'll write 2 squared, minus 4y squared. So that gives me 6 minus 4 is 2 minus 4y squared. Where am I going to test this? I'm going to test this at the critical point, which is y equals 0. I'm going to put in the boundaries of y equals 1 and y equals negative 1. All right, so 2 minus 0 is 2. If I put in the 1, I get 2 minus 4 times 1, which is negative 2. And here I'll get 2 minus 4. If I put in a negative 1, negative 1 squared is 1. And again, that gives me negative 2. So these, again, are z values. So I get extrema at z equals plus minus 2. Great. Now we need to answer the question. We wanted to find the extrema. We did a whole bunch of calculations to get us there, pull it all together. Out of all these numbers, don't forget there's another number hanging around on top, and that is that 6. Out of all the numbers, 6, 2, and negative 2, that 6 is the highest. So there is an absolute max at 0, 0, 6. As for the absolute mins, there's a bunch of them. The absolute min is negative 2. Where does that happen? That happens at x equals plus minus 2 and y equals plus minus 1. So there's actually four points. 2, 1, negative 2, negative 2, 1, negative 2, 2, negative 1, negative 2, and negative 2, negative 1, negative 2. Right? So there's four different points that produce a minimum of negative 2. Okay, that's one way to do it with the x values. Let's take a look at another way to do it. Let's find maxes and mins by using parameters. Here's my function, f of x, y equals 2x squared plus y squared. This time, the base is not a nice rectangle, it's a circle. And so the region are all the points on the inside of that circle, including the boundary. Here's my set of steps. I'm going to find the partial derivative and the critical points. I'm going to define the boundary curve parametrically, sub it back in to get some function g of t. And now it's not so bad anymore, because now everything's in terms of one variable. You're almost back to calc 1 stuff. Take the derivative, get your critical points, find the critical t value, maxes and mins and x's and y's and then make the conclusion. So you are going to have to find an interior point at some point as well, and then compare your answers at the end. All right, so let's start with the function that we have. We have f of x, y equals 2x squared plus y squared. So the partial with respect to x is 4x. 
The partial with respect to y is 2y. Set these equal to 0, and yeah, you do sort of get a critical point at 0, 0 that's on the inside. Throw it back in, f of 0, 0 is also 0. So that 0 is my z value. We're going to hang on to that because we're going to need it later. The next thing then, we said we were going to define the circle parametrically. So if x squared plus y squared equals 16, you know that I can replace the x's with a 4 cosine t, because if x is cosine and y is sine, this is just a circle with a radius of 4 centered at the origin. So I can set this up as x equals 4 cosine t, y equals 4 sine t. If you don't believe it, take those and throw it back, and you'll get 16 cosine squared plus 16 sine squared equals 16, and it does work. All right, now what we've got to do is take those parameters and throw it back into the original function. So I'm going to call my new function g of t. Go back up here to your 2x squared, except this time replace the x with a 4 cosine of t. All right, now come back up here to your y. You'll get plus 4 sine of t squared. All right, work this out. 4 squared is 16. 16 times 2 is 32. So I get 32 cosine squared t plus 16 sine squared t. Okay, that's my g of t. Now I need a derivative of that. So when I derive this, the chain rule is going to come in. So g prime of t is going to give me this thing really is the cosine of t squared. So when I drop that 2 in front, 2 times 32 is 64 cosine of t times the derivative of the inside. Well, the derivative of cosine is negative sine, so maybe I'll put my sine here and my negative on the outside. All right, same thing's going to happen over here. If this is the sine of t squared, drop the 2 in front, and I'll get plus 32 sine of t times the derivative of sine, which is cosine. Okay, add those two things together, and I get g prime of t equals negative 32 cosine t sine t. And now I want to set that equal to 0. Well, I'm going to end up with a bunch of answers, right? One of them is going to be where is cosine equal to 0. Cosine is equal to 0 at pi over 2. And also at 3 pi over 2. Where is the sine equal to 0? The sine is equal to 0 at 0 and then also at pi. Now, which of the z values are higher? We've got to take these values and put them back in to g of t. So let's find g of 0. g of 0 is going to give me the same answer as g of pi. Which is what? If I put a 0 in for t, cosine of 0 is 1. 4 times 1 is 4. So that'll give me 2 times 4 squared, and we know the sine part's just going to be 0, so that'll give me a 32. All right, now let's evaluate g of pi over 2. g of pi over 2 is actually going to be the same as g of 3 pi over 2, because even if the sine becomes negative, it's going to end up being squared in the end. So the cosine of pi over 2 is 0. That'll leave me with a 4 sine of pi over 2 squared. Well, the sine of pi over 2 is 1. I got to square the 4. And then 1 times 16 is 16. So the 32 is the higher of them. The 16 is a lower. But don't forget, all the way at the beginning of the problem, there was a value that we had found from the interior points, and that was this guy over here. That was the 0. So the points that are in play are this. 0, 0, 0. That was the interior point. And now I've got points on the exterior. So now I've got to figure out absolute maxes and mins. 
I have the winner for the absolute min. The winner for the absolute min is right there. It's zero. Neither of these two values, 32 or 16, are bigger than zero, which is the max. The max is here at 32. So that 16 is really nothing. It is not the absolute min. It's not the absolute max. It's something in between. Where did that absolute max happen? Well, let's put in values for zero and for pi and convert back to x, y, z coordinates. If I put a zero into the g function, right, I want to find g of zero, that's what gave me the 32. Where did I get that function from? I got it from a set of parameters, right? x equals 4 cosine of t, y equals 4 sine of t. So let's start with t equals zero. At t equals zero, cosine of zero is one, so I get a four. Sine of zero is zero. So the point four zero is in play. All right, how about t of pi, or t evaluated at pi? Cosine of pi is negative one. So four times negative one is negative four. Sine of pi is still zero, so I get negative four zero. So the absolute max is going to be plus minus 4, 0, 32. Okay, so there's two places where that absolute max happens. The max itself is just 32, but where does it happen? It happens at 4, 0, 32 and negative 4, 0, 32. All right, I'm going to make one more video with the optimization problem because this is getting a little long and that one's long. So let's do one more from 15, 7.